protect coast the coast, but um, sorry. The Coastal Act actually calls for the balanced conservation and utilization of coastal resources. And this in part means siting and designing new, new development in a way that is the least environmentally damaging alternative, minimizes risks from coastal hazards, establishes stable urban rural boundaries, and guides new development into areas with adequate services, like adequate water and septic. So because the coast is this finite place with lots of demand for development, one key goal of the Coastal Act is to prioritize coastal dependent and related development on and near the shoreline over general commercial, industrial, and residential development. Uh, coastal dependent, dependent development includes um, coastal industries like shipping, aquaculture, and commercial fishing, and it also includes recreation like boating. And coastal related uses that are prioritized include visitor serving commercial uses, especially lower cost visitor serving accommodations so that all Californians can afford to visit the coast. Um, the goal of the Coastal Act uh, that is most celebrated is maximizing public access. The Coastal Act strong public access policies are the reason California's coast is so much more free and accessible than many other coastlines in our country. Uh, the Coastal Act basically mandates um, a maximization of public access. Uh, so many of the coastal access points along the coast exist because they were required of a private property owner through the coastal development permit process or, or negotiated out of that process. So for instance, just one random example, this is Target and Eureka when um, Sears was bought and demolished and turned into Target. There was a coastal development permit and out of that coastal development permit, we got this public access parking and trail and boat ramp behind Target. So the point is, if you stumble on a public access way through or along private property and you wonder how it got there, chances are the Coastal Commission had a part in it. So how are the goals and policies of the Coastal Act implemented? The Coastal Act requires any person wishing to undertake development in the coastal zone to obtain a coastal development permit. In addition to what you would typically think of as development, development under the Coastal Act includes changes in the density intensity of use of land, including subdivisions, and it also includes changes in access to coastal waters. So for instance, this beach curfew that was recently imposed at Mad River Beach, um, as shown in this picture, is considered development under the Coastal Act and required a coastal development permit because it affects public access to water. So like I said, the Coastal Act requires any person who wants to develop in the coastal zone to get a permit. So you're probably wondering where is the coastal zone? Um, the coastal zone extends three miles out to sea um, inland, it ranges from a few hundred feet in urban areas to up to five miles in rural areas. Um, here is a picture of the inland extent of the coastal zone around Humboldt Bay. Um, the coastal zone is in, it's a blue line on this map. You can see that the, the coastal zone is pretty narrow in urban Eureka and Arcata, but it goes pretty far inland in, for instance, the Eel River bottomlands where it's more rural. And um, because the mapping of the coastal zone was a political process done by the state legislature, the boundary does not always follow a consistent geographic logic. So for instance, Ferndale, if you can see at the bottom of the screen, is largely outside of the coastal zone, but land inland of Ferndale is inside of the coastal zone. Hey, Kristen, real quick. Um, yeah. One of the questions in the chat is, do you know if Oregon and Washington have a similar coastal commission so that there's a common protection along the coast? Yeah, um, so there's the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act, and um, I'm pretty sure all of the states, like coastal states, have a coastal management agency. I know California's definitely, under the Coastal Act, has um, more power than a lot of the other state man coastal management agencies. Um, but they all have one, including Alaska. Thanks. So, um, so to recap, development on the coast, you need a permit, um, and you either apply for that permit to the, from, you get it from the Coastal Commission or a city or county with a certified local coastal program or LCP for short. 
So where in areas where a city or county has a certified LCP, they're the ones that issue the coastal development permit. Um, and your permit has to be found consistent, your development has to be found consistent with that LCP. Um, in some cases, those local government permit decisions are appealable to the commission. Um, the Coastal Commission maintains permitting jurisdiction on tide lands, submerged lands, and public trust lands, like in harbors and bays and beaches, and in areas where there aren't any certified LCPs. And um, in these cases, development must be found consistent with the Coastal Act. Uh, so what is an LCP? It's basically um, those portions of a city or county's general plan and municipal code that implement the Coastal Act at the local level. The LCPs, they indicate the kinds, locations, and intensities of development that are allowed in the coastal zone. So they do include the city or county's land use map and zoning district map for the coastal zone. Once um, each LCP is reviewed and approved by the Coastal Commission um, as consistent with and adequate to carry out the Coastal Act, and once it's certified by the Commission, the responsibility for issuing most coastal development permits is delegated to the local government. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that even when issued by a local government, a coastal development permit is a state level permit. It is a delegated state power that gives local governments some oversight over state agencies and their jurisdictions. So for instance, state agencies like HSU, Caltrans, and CHP all have property in Arcata's coastal zone. Those state agencies aren't required to obtain local permits to develop in Arcata. However, if they're undertaking development in Arcata's coastal zone, they do have to come to the city for a coastal development permit. There are 76 local governments in the coastal zone, cities and counties, and 62 of them have certified LCPs. Um, the cities of Trinidad, Arcata, Eureka, and the Humboldt, and the county of Humboldt, they all have certified LCPs that were certified in the 1980s. Um, the commission has certified amendments to these LCPs, but there haven't been any major updates except for Eureka's land use plan was overhauled in 1999. Um, there's no legal requirement to update LCPs once they're certified, so many LCPs statewide are woefully out of date. Although all the local governments in Humboldt County want to update their LCPs and are working on updating them, this work is often not prioritized over things like housing element updates and flood zone ordinance updates where there are very severe consequences for failing to update, such as loss of funding or regulatory control. And even though Humboldt, all of the Humboldt local governments have LCPs, a lot of Humboldt Bay is actually still in the commission's retained uh, coastal development permitting jurisdiction. Um, and as I mentioned before, the commission retains jurisdiction over tide lands, submerged lands, and public trust lands. Um, that includes a lot of diked former tide lands around Humboldt Bay. Um, so figuring out who has permit jurisdiction where uh, is really complicated around Humboldt Bay. Um, here's some examples. The Nordic Aqua Farms project that's proposed for the, the spit that at Redwood Terminal 1, that project is largely in the county's LCP jurisdiction, so the county would be reviewing a permit for that. And that permit would be appealable to the Coastal Commission if it were approved, um, either by two commissioners or by any member of the public that participated at the local level. The Arcata Wastewater Treatment Plant, on the other hand, is located on former tidelands in the Commission's retained jurisdiction. So the, the city is preparing to do a lot of updates there. They're going to apply to the Coastal Commission directly for a permit for those improvements. Um, and then here's where it gets tricky, this third example, the Highway 101 Safety Corridor Project. It included land in the Commission's retained jurisdiction as well as land in the city of Arcata, Eureka, and Humboldt County's jurisdiction. So um, in cases like that, if the applicant requests and the local governments agree, um, the commission can process a consolidated permit for the entire project. And that's what happened with the, um, the overpass and the safety project. Um, in those cases, um, in other cases, for various reasons, the applicant may not request consolidation or the local government may not agree to consolidation. And then the applicant would be required to get a separate permit from every jurisdiction implicated by the project. So Arcata, Eureka, and Humboldt County, just so you know, they have these really great online uh, interactive maps 
that you can see and on them there's a layer that you can click on to see whose jurisdiction your project's in and whether you're in the coastal zone or not. Um, and you can always call or, or well now best to email us um, if you have any questions about that and we can help you out because it is definitely confusing. So um, the Coastal Commission is also one of three California agencies in charge of administering the Federal Coastal Zone Management Act in California. Um, the federal CZMA gives state coastal management agencies regulatory control known as Federal Consistency Review Authority over all federal activities, permits, licenses, and funding approvals for projects that affect coastal zone resources. So here are two examples of projects that require or will require federal consistency review. The Trinidad Rancheria is a sovereign nation and its tribal trust lands are not part of the coastal zone. However, the commission had federal consistency review authority over the proposed Trinidad Rancheria Hotel project because the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a federal agency, is providing a loan guarantee for the project. The federal government's involvement with that loan guarantee is what sparked the federal consistency review by the commission. Um, another potential upcoming project that will require federal consistency review is the Department of the Interior's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management leasing in federal waters for offshore wind development. Um, an important aspect of the Commission's federal consistency authority is that it extends beyond the coastal zone to any federal activity that could affect coastal zone resources. So, for instance, the Commission has authority over the leasing, development, and production of offshore oil and gas resources in federal waters beyond the state's three-mile limit because offshore oil development in federal waters could impact coastal zone resources. So after President Trump was elected, the federal government recommended that federal waters offshore Northern California be leased for oil and gas development. Any lease sale will require federal consistency review with the Coastal Commission. This review authority is a key way other state agencies and local communities can address their concerns about the adverse effects of offshore oil. So the Coastal Commission has a great deal of power to influence land use planning through LCP certifications, coastal development permitting, appeals, and federal consistency determinations. So you may be curious who these decision makers are. The Commission is composed of 12 voting members. Um, four each are elected by the Governor, the Senate Rules Committee, and the Speaker of the Assembly. Um, six of the 12 are locally elected officials and six are chosen from the public at large. The six locally elected members are county supervisors or city or count city council members from the six different coastal regions. Mike is one of the six elected officials and he was appointed by the governor. The governor always appoints the North Coast Region Commissioner who is an elected official in Del Norte, Humboldt or Mendocino County. Commission meets once a month, typically for three days. Until this pandemic, meetings were scheduled in various communities up and down the coast, with only one meeting located north of Sonoma County each year. Although meetings were televised, members of the public could only participate if they traveled to the meeting and spoke in person, which made it hard for people living in Humboldt to participate. Now meetings are being conducted virtually via Zoom, and it's expected that it will continue that way until we can congregate again safely in large groups. So I encourage you to tune in and participate um, during these virtual meetings that are, happen once a month. Um, we just had one, Mike just had one last week, um, and the next one is in September, September 9th through 11th. So um, the Coastal Commission is supported by a staff of approximately 160 individuals statewide. There are six district offices. Like I said, I work in the North Coast District Office. We are supported by a number of staff statewide. For instance, we have a technical services department that includes specialists like ecologists and engineer and a geologist to help us review more technical aspects of coastal development projects. We also have a large team of lawyers stationed in San Francisco because we deal with a lot of litigation. Um, we also have an enforcement program that investigates violations of the Coastal Act and we have an education unit that awards public education grants um, from our whale tail license plate program and acts as a lead on the California Kings, King Tides project, um, among other activities. So our staff is really small for the area of land that we cover and the amount of work that we do. For example, we only have one public information officer statewide 
that fields all of our press and media, and she also has other duties. Um, we also have only one staff member stationed in Sacramento who's, who's tracking and um, involved in all the bills that are of interest to or implicate the commission. So that's the first half of my presentation um, about the Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission. Um, I'd like to take any, Mike and I can field any questions about that now before I move on to sea level rise. There was one question in the chat um, and it was um, referring, does the commission require permit updates and if so, how often? Permit updates as in, um, once you receive a permit, whether you have to update it. Yeah, that's the way I read it. Well, um, once people, re once somebody receives a permit, um, once it's vested in that, like somebody did some work on it, then it doesn't, you're, you have the right to do that development um, forever, basically. Um, if it hasn't been vested, there's a, there's a con standard condition put on coastal development permits that basically says you have two years to start work um, and you can always apply for an extension um, be before that your permit expires. Um, but if there's been changed conditions, um, the commission can um, deny the extension, but um, if not, they'll, uh, they'll grant the extension for you to do your work. I had a question. I had a further question regarding, I have a further question regarding that and it relates to um, if the Coastal Commission, the 12 members see that there's a problem in a particular area that isn't being handled according to the rules, does the Commission have a right to intervene? In other words, if they're not following the rules of their designated authority. So are you talking about the local governments when the local yes. government? Yes. Um, the commission will, um, I mean, the commission can pursue any violation of the Coastal Act, but one of the goals of the, the Coastal Act is, is for cooperation between local and state governments. So if we feel that the state, it, the local government is not um, implementing their, their local coastal program appropriately, um, we definitely would um, first spend a lot of time working with them um, before anything happened. Um, officially, you know, we would, we would work, uh, we would talk with them and, um, you know, I've never seen an LCP revoked. I've seen, um, there's these orders that are um, called categorical exclusion orders that are granted to individual cities or counties um, that allow them to exempt certain forms of development um, from needing a permit. Uh, you know, basically they're for categories of development that, that won't likely raise coastal resource issues. And I've seen the commission um, revoke one of those for, um, from a, um, I, it was some some jurisdiction in Sonoma or Marin because Eric, they were happy with. I want to jump in here because there's also uh, the issue of specific projects that may or you know that may or may not have done what they're supposed to do, and in that case, there is enforcement capability from the Coastal Commission. So we have enforcement staff, and part of that team of attorneys that we have also. Uh, brings, you know, the weight of the state in terms of enforcing um, the conditions um, that are put on every permit. How does that intervention occur? Well, typically, um, if it doesn't, uh, for most of the time it happens because there's, uh, um, so someone has, you know, let the commission know or commission staff know of a violation um, and then staff generally reaches out to try and abate that situation. Most of the time it happens pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but if it does get elevated to an enforcement action, then um, again, it's um, a legal matter that, uh, you know, is dealt with. And there, for most permits, you know, the, the, the permits themselves have the weight of encumbrances associated with those permits. And those are all legally enforceable. 
So uh, that's, and I, I haven't been on the commission long enough to see where anyone has not uh, eventually complied uh, with, with, with those uh, enforcement matters. And then I have a question with regard to oil leasing um, and the attempt by the administration to promote uh, oil leases offshore. Is the commission involved in that? And if so, how has it responded and is, has its response been effective? Um, the commission has submitted a um, few letters on this, this point um, to the federal government saying that we don't support that. Um, and uh, in terms of whether it's been effective, I'm not sure. And I would say we haven't, we haven't received any applications for a project to review. So um, yeah, it hasn't, come, it hasn't come to the board in that way, other than advocacy, um, like Kristen was mentioning. So. But have, have oil leases actually been granted by no, the federal no. government? No. No. If before any leases um, could be made, they'd have to come to us for federal consistency review. They've just talked about the potential for leasing. Okay. They haven't actually taken an action yet. That's and reassuring. <laughs> well, you have, you have to also uh, uh, take into account that any offshore leasing would have to have onshore support, um, like, you know, physical infrastructure support. And um, that's also, you know, within the bounds of the, of the Coastal Commission's jurisdiction. Um, should I hold questions about the um, 101 corridor stru uh, structure till later? Yeah, I'm gonna okay, cool. bring it up with sea level rise planning. That was great, thank you. Kristen, I have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, yeah. One, um, people are curious about the um, status of the aquatic fish farm and if there's you know, any updates that you can share about that. I am not involved in that project. Um, I don't know if Mike knows anything. Yeah, that's at the county level currently. So you have an applicant that's working with the, the Harbor District to work on the infrastructure related to that and, and the requirements of that. So that will have to go through the county planning process first. Um, and um, so that's where, it's, that's where its next stop is, I guess you'd say. But I don't know what they're, um, where they're at in terms of um, in that planning process. And the other, um, the other project that people are curious about is the offshore um, wind project. Do you have any updates on that? No, I don't believe we've received any um, anything yet from um, the Bureau of Ocean Management about the offshore leases for for the wind. Um, I know that the there's you know a particular offshore wind company that's that's definitely been talking to a lot of people locally. Um, but no, nothing has been submitted yet in terms of a project. And this would be another. This would be another example where onshore facilities are part of that. And so again, the Harbor District is in negotiations and discussions with um, interested parties um, associated with that. And also, um, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority has also been having those discussions. And so um, they're. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that's, there's not a plan that's been put forward. You know, these things have to, you know, marinate and people have to get their act together and, and all that stuff before they present something that then the, the jurisdictions can actually deliberate over. Right now, it's all advisory. In some of our past presentations, we've had um, different people come and speak about both those projects. So I think um, we just are wondering about updates. So. Um, let me see, there's one new message. And then it's also a status of a trailer park proposed under the east side of the Samoa Bridge. Is that? That's the city of Eureka. Eureka. Yeah, and so um, they, have, they have the jurisdictional authority to, to do that process. Um, um, and I believe that probably the only way it would actually come to the commission is on appeal. I think that's correct, but maybe Kristen could correct me on that. So we're talking about um, in our Eureka by Halverson Park. 
by the Samoa Bridge. Yeah, that's um, a joint project uh, between the city and a, a private property owner. And um, the city is going to be updating the boat ramp there, the public boat ramp, and um, replacing the, they're going to put in a nice new bathroom. And um, we're in the Coastal Commission, sorry, most Coastal Commission is going to be permitting, I believe, just the boat ramp. And then the RV park is in the city's uh, coastal development permitting jurisdiction. So they'll be um, they'll be permitting that RV park, but it's in an area that's appealable to the Coastal Commission. So um, any two um, Coastal Commissioners could appeal that permit. If, if the city were to approve an RV park there, any two Commissioners could appeal that to the Coastal Commission or any member of the public who participates at the local level, and that means um, sending in a letter on a hearing item or going to speak um, or speaking virtually on a hearing on the hearing item for that when it goes to the city. Um, but they have not put out a project referral yet. So um, it's still um, in the beginning stages. I know they've done an environmental document for that RV park, but they haven't. Um, we haven't gotten a referral from them that they've started some sort of coastal development permit application on it. So there's a, a question here that um, came for you, Mike, and um, and I just want to interject it here before we get moving on to the, the second part of the presentation. Um, people are wondering, what is unique about being the commissioner representing the relatively rural and remote, re remote North Coast? Well, um, yeah, it definitely brings a different perspective um, to the commission, certainly. Um, Issues related to uh, natural resources when we're talking about, you know, um, fishing and aquaculture, but even, of course, um, uh, native um, uh, and um, indigenous issues are certainly something that um, <clears throat> uh, have to bring to the fore or discuss. But actually, part of it has been a lot of the discussion has been around the character changing associated with small towns on the coast and about um, housing issues. And, and um, currently I'm the, I'm the only Governor Newsom appointee on, on the commission at the time right now. Um, and so um, uh, it's been, uh, since I've been there a year, so uh, one year ago was my first meeting, which was in August of last year. Uh, we've really talked a lot about the changes that um, short-term rentals have, you know, the character changing nature of short-term rentals, not just the characters of, of, of the town, or literally the characters, the people, and how that, how that, the impact of that and affordable housing within, within the coastal zone and its impact on the workforce that services those areas, but then, you know, what is affordable in terms of um, access uh, to people visiting the coast. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it does, I do have a somewhat of a different perspective um, than maybe a lot of the folks on the Coastal Commission, but at the same time, I mean, there's a broad width of, of experience um, there. And I do want to mention that um, Commissioner Brownsey uh, lives in Fort Bragg area, so we have another secret North Coast Commissioner. She's, she was uh, appointed from the public at large. One more quick question before we move on. Um, if we do attend one of the Zoom commission meetings, um, is there a three minute question limit or how does that work? Uh, I can jump into there. Um, well, these days I think it's down to one minute because <clears throat> what when, when um, Kristen mentioned I had a meeting last week, well, it was a three day meeting and the first day was 11 and a half hours of, of Zoom and the next day was eight and a half hours of Zoom and the, <laughs> and then, you know, I think we got off uh, with less than five or something on Friday. Um, a lot of that has to do with public comment so that now things are kind of opened up and people don't have to like travel someplace. You know, we're getting comment. Even at two meetings ago, I was just shocked personally. Like there was pups, some young people giving public comment literally in the passenger seat of a car on Zoom, right? So you don't even have to be in a stand, you know, a standalone location to be actually engaged in that process. You can actually be moving through time and space. And um, so that's opened up a lot of opportunity, which is, is really a wonderful thing. Um, but on the flip side of that, we have uh, some issues that are quite um, 
um, controversial and people want to comment that on them every day, all the time. And you'll get, you know, you can get dozens and dozens of folks doing that. Um, um, and, and so it can take, take a, a lot of time. So that's why um, public comment for most things has dropped to, if it's not two minutes, one minute for some, some things. And we really ask folks to, you know, consolidate with other people uh, if they can, their comments, and also, you know, even provide just video presentations to get, get, um, get their points across. So, um, yes, absolutely uh, participate. I, I think it's, it's great, but understand that, um, uh, and we're even now up to four days a month. We actually have put on an X today because we missed a couple of meetings due to the COVID situation. So I hope that answers the question. I definitely think it did. Thank you. Um, I think I'm, Kristen, let's go ahead and, and move on with the second part. And there, there are a couple more questions, but I think you can, um, you'll probably either talk about them in, in the body of your presentation. Or we can pick those up at the end. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to circle back with anything we don't answer. All right. Okay, so um, the second half of my presentation, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the Commission's role in sea level rise adaptation planning around Humboldt Bay. Um, as all of you live near the coast, I'm sure no one here disputes that sea levels are rising and coastal storms are getting worse. Coastal flooding and erosion has always been an issue on Humboldt Bay, but sea level rise will increase the future rates, magnitudes, and likelihoods of these hazards beyond what we have experienced before. Um, due to local land subsidence, Humboldt Bay has the highest rate of sea level rise on the west coast um, of the United States. These sea level rise projections that I'm showing on the screen are for the north spit of Humboldt Bay and are based on the Ocean Protection Council's 2018 State of California sea level rise guidance, um, which the commis commission is asserting is the current best available science. Um, these first two columns are known as the low risk aversion scenario and the medium risk aversion scenario, and these are probabilistic projections. Um, before 2050, differences in sea level rise projections under different greenhouse gas emissions numbers um, are minor, but after 2050, projections increasingly depend on the trajectory of our greenhouse gas emissions. So that's why you start to see a range of potential increases under years 2070 and 2100 in this table. These reflect a low and a high emissions scenario. Unfortunately, scientific models and research increasingly point to the fact that sea level rise is happening faster than projected and will likely be greater than previously forecasted. A critical caveat with the projections in these first two columns is that they do not account for the most recent science regarding the potential for rapid ice sheet loss, um, and therefore they may underestimate probabilities of higher sea level rise scenarios. So this third column, the extreme risk aversion scenario, uh, is based on those recent studies of rapid ice sheet loss. Um, and it includes the projection curve that results in approximately 10.9 feet of sea level rise on Humboldt Bay by 2100. Um, unfortunately, based on our emissions up to today, we are locked into at least six and a half feet of sea level rise at some time in the future, regardless of whether we stop emitting tomorrow. Um, here are some of the current water levels on Humboldt Bay that we consider when we think about flooding with sea level rise. Mean annual maximum water is currently 8.8 .8 feet in elevation on Humboldt Bay. These are the king tides or tidal elevations associated with storms. If you are at a location along the shoreline that only gets flooded by mean annual maximum water, flooding is occurring around four times a year. Mean monthly maximum water is the average monthly highest tide and it is currently 7.7 .7 feet at the North Spit tide gauge. So if you're at 7.7 .7 feet on the shoreline without any intervening barrier, you're getting flooded about once a month. Um, the final number here is mean higher high water, which is currently 6.5 feet and it's the daily average high tide. Um, so it occurs you know, waters get this high every one to two days. Um, and as you can see, uh, average king tides are only about a foot above monthly average high tides, and monthly average high tides are only about a foot higher than daily average high tides. Um, so what that means is that with 1.1 1 1 .1 feet of sea level rise, the king tides of today start to occur once a month, and then with another 1.2 feet of sea level rise, the king tides of today become a daily occurrence. 
Um, so 1.1 feet of sea level rise means that places right now that just flood during king tides and storm events like Pine Hill Road south of Eureka, they're going to start to flood about once a month. And then with 2.3 feet of sea level rise, places right now that flood during king tides like Pine Hill Road, we'll start to see those flood during daily average high tides. So looking back at the OPC's projections, um, ignoring that extreme risk column, you know, 1.1 feet of sea level rise is projected to occur within 20 years. And 2.3 feet of sea level, sea level rise will occur somewhere between 30 and 60 years from now. The complicating factor on Humboldt Bay is that we have a lot of low-lying land that would be flooded today if it weren't for intervening dikes. Uh, shoreline inventory was produced by Alderon Laird in 2010, indicating that 75% of the Humboldt Bay shoreline is artificial barrier type structures, including 41 miles of dikes and 11 miles of railroad. These dikes and railroad form a barrier protecting nearly 10,000 acres of low-lying land from tidal inundation. So that, that low-lying diked former tide land would be flooded today without any sea level rise if it weren't for the dikes protection. And um, those dikes and levees are largely not high enough to address sea level rise and are a lot of them are in significant disrepair and there's no centralized dike district. So um, they're owned by individual property owners and of course by the, the railroad. Um, our regional transportation network and a great deal of our utility infrastructure, including water lines, power lines, and fiber optic cables are located on these dike former tidelands. But the entities that own the infrastructure, like pg &E and Caltrans, they often do not own the barrier structures that protect these lands from flooding. Um, these former tidelands are also the location of many coastal resources, um, like public access ways, archeological resources, um, and they're also the location of significant um, soil and groundwater contamination from our um, timber industrial past. And that's a problem because that could become mobilized from sea level rise, um, flooding and erosion, and particularly from rising groundwater with sea level rise. Um, Alderon Laird and other local experts have said that a 10 foot tidal elevation is the tipping point for our dike shoreline. At this point, we would see a significant jump in the area of dike overtopped and huge areas of bottom lands would be flooded. This is just about 1.2 feet above current average king tides and 2.3 feet above the current average monthly high tide. Um, and as we know from events like that 2005 New Year's Eve storm event that you might remember, um, it just takes one storm surge high tide event and a few um, breaches in levees to cause a lot of flooding of low lying land. Um, and so a lot of resources have been dedicated to evaluating just how vulnerable we are to sea level rise about, around Humboldt Bay. Um, Arcata, Eureka, and Humboldt County, they all have vulnerability assessments that identify critical assets um, that are vulnerable to how many feet of sea level rise. And Alderon Laird has been really a big part of that. Um, I know he gives lectures for Ollie. Um, he also recently for Humboldt County um, looked at vulnerability uh, based on watershed, um, and that's available on Humboldt County's website if you're interested. Um, but unfortunately, we are just starting to move beyond identifying how vulnerable we are and working towards actually planning to be more resilient. So there are three general strategies uh, for sea level rise adaptation, protection, accommodation, and retreat. Retreat strategies remove or relocate existing development out of hazard areas and they limit the construction of new development. Accommodation strategies modify existing developments or design new developments to increase resiliency, um, such as by elevating roadways and houses. This is a picture of a house in King Salmon that has been adapted to accommodate flooding. Uh, protection strategies refer to defending the shoreline in place without changing the development you are protecting. So protection strategies, they can be divided further into hard and soft armoring measures. Soft armoring refers to the use of natural features like beaches, dunes, and wetlands to buff buffer coastal resources, or sorry, to buffer coastal areas. Um, this bo bottom drawing on this slide, it's showing a hybrid approach that uses both soft and hard armoring to defend development in place. So it's easy to quickly jump to hard protection as a solution in all situations because um, 
it's relatively cheaper to just add rock slope protection or raise your levy. Um, however, hard armoring can be uh, problematic. One consequence of armoring is known as coastal squeeze. And when hard structures are used to protect backshore development, they become barriers that fix the back of the shoreline, impeding the ability of beaches and habitats to naturally migrate inland over time. Um, beaches, dunes, and wetlands that cannot migrate inland because of seawalls or other barriers will eventually be squeezed out and lost, caught between rising seas and immovable shoreline structures. Um, so the pictures on the left show natural beach retreat and then the pictures on the right show the when your sea level rises and you have something fixing the back of the beach, you, you lose your beach. Um, and so here's another visual of that concept. Um, a 2017 USGS study found that up to 67% of beaches in Southern California could be completely lost by the year 2100 without new management actions. Armoring in these situations becomes an environmental justice issue because it benefits rich coastal property owners who, can, who get to protect their houses um, up on bluffs over the general public who loses their beach access. On Humboldt Bay, coastal squeeze will eventually result in the loss of vulnerable intertidal habitats. This could have a huge effect on the health of the bay and in turn affect our economy. Over 90% of the historic salt marsh habitat in Humboldt Bay has already been lost, and if we just augment hard armoring in place with sea level rise, we could lose even more. Um, losing salt marsh is also bad for our adaptive capacity. Um, wetlands are critical for absorbing storm energy and holding floodwaters. Another issue with hard armoring is that it reflects more wave energy than a more natural shoreline, causing erosion on other parts of your shoreline. Basically, armoring causes erosion, which results in the need for more armoring and so on. Um, the bigger issue is that armoring alone cannot save us from flooding in the long term because of issues with stormwater drainage and rising groundwater. Um, so I'm going to use this example of fields landing. Um, this residential community is on um, low elevation former salt marsh, um, and it is at six to eight feet in elevation. Um, the, remember that our average monthly high tide on Humboldt Bay is 7.7 .7 feet. So the first idea that comes to mind to protect fields landing from rising waters is to construct a new barrier structure to prevent tidal inundation of this low elevation community. You just fortify the railroad grade seaward of the community, put the coastal trail on top of it, and be done. Um, unfortunately, this would not solve field landing's flooding problems. When the elevation of a neighborhood is lower than sea level, that neighborhood will have an issue draining stormwater runoff. Fields landing is below eight feet in elevation. When king tides occur, which are over eight feet, salt water currently rises through the storm drains, flooding surface streets and intersections in the community as shown in this picture. As I mentioned previously, with just 1.1 feet of sea level rise, which is anticipated all, under all the state sea level rise scenarios to occur by 2040, Storm drains and fields landing will be flooding once a month. So with sea level rise, in addition to a tidal barrier, the community will need to plug its storm drains and actively pump stormwater runoff into the bay because it will no longer be able to gravity drain stormwater. Um, however, even with the barrier and pumping, the community is still in dire straits because current groundwater elevations are within one to two feet of ground surface. As sea levels rise, ground water elevations will also rise on the coast where the two are connected. And rising groundwater can mobilize contamination, it can compromise water supplies and structural foundations, and it can emerge above ground and flood an area. And groundwater will likely emerge on the surface of most of fields landing with one to two feet of sea level rise, um, which is projected to occur, like I said before, pretty quickly. Um, so this to have this residential community continue in its current location with emerging groundwater, streets would need to be elevated and homes rebuilt on top of pilings. So when you start to add up the cost of building a barrier structure, pumping stormwater, and elevating streets and homes, and think about the limited time frame, it starts to feel really overwhelming. And the point I'm trying to make is that even if we build levees at 20 feet elevation, we're still going to eventually lose the low-lying land behind the levees. Um, in, in some areas, it's just retreat. Um, we can't, it's inevitable um, because of these other issues. So what is the Coastal Commission doing to help? 
The Coastal Commission is using its permitting and planning authority to push for sea level rise adaptation. Um, with permitting, because we now understand that flooding is getting worse over time, the Coastal Commission reviews development in the coastal zone. Um, when they do that, they consider not just current risk, but future, they want to minimize risk to hazards um, over the li anticipated lifetime of a development given projected sea level rise. So, you know, for instance, instead of just looking at historic flood levels to determine how high to elevate a building, which is what we used to do, the commission is now looking at future potential flood heights over the life of a structure um, to determine how high you would need to build that structure to be safe from sea level rise flooding over its lifetime. Um, this commission also adopted a sea level rise guidance document in 2015 to provide broad guidance on sea level rise permitting and planning and commission staff is currently working on more specific guidance documents focused on residential development and critical infrastructure. Commission staff also now has a dedicated sea level rise team who monitor and provide uh, guidance on sea level permitting and planning statewide. Um, the commission also has a grant program to incentivize local governments to update their LCPs to address sea level rise. Like I mentioned before, the commission has no power to require local governments to update their LCPs. So grants are a really critical tool for sparking LCP updates. Currently, the commission has awarded 68 local planning grants to 40 jurisdictions, totaling some $8.3 million through six rounds of grants. Uh, Humble County jurisdictions have received a number of these grants and some additional planning grants from the OPC. Um, and that's where a lot of those vulnerability assessments came out of. Um, Despite all this funding though, the commission we still haven't, hasn't received any LCP update submittals yet from local Humboldt County governments regarding sea level rise. Um, we know that a lot of work has already gone into developing updated policies and regulations and just a little bit more of a push is needed to get those updates locally adopted and submitted. So please put pressure on your local government to update their LCP. Um, so this is my last slide. I wanted to end the presentation by talking briefly about some of the challenges and opportunities of planning for sea level rise on Humboldt Bay. Um, I first wanted to talk about using LCPs as the vehicle for sea level rise planning. Um, one challenge of planning through the LCP is that an LCP just covers the coastal zone of one particular city or county where sea level rise really demands comprehensive cross-jurisdictional planning for the bay as a whole. Um, also, the LCPs do not cover all the land that will be impacted by sea level rise. Uh, like I said before, there's diked former tidelands um, that are located in the commission's retained permitting jurisdiction that are outside of LCP planning areas, and um, sea level rise impacts will extend inland of the coastal zone um, particularly in urban Arcata and Eureka, where the coastal zone is really narrow. Like for instance, Arcata with sea level rise, one of their big issues is going to be draining um, stormwater and backwater flooding of their creeks and streams inland of the coastal zone. Um, another challenge is that sparking sea level rise adaptation through the regulation and permitting of new development is not effective at addressing inaction and inaction is a huge problem. Um, for instance, if no one does anything to address flooding in fields landing, that would result in the largest social, environmental, and economic costs, but we cannot require adaptation through coastal development permitting unless some action, some development is proposed. Uh, one key opportunity with planning through LCPs is that once certified the, by the commission, LCPs are a state level document. Um, having the backing of the state is legally and politically important um, with controversial policies um, that are inevitably going to be controversial to deal with sea level rise. Um, also, the state can help all the local governments um, work together to have consistent policies for Humboldt Bay. And like I mentioned before, um, LCPs give local governments some authority of, over the development of state agencies like Caltrans. Um, Moving on, um, the location of existing development. Um, another challenge with sea level rise planning is definitely that there's a lot of development um, that's vulnerable. A 2015 economic assessment estimated that eight to $10 billion of existing property in California is likely to be underwater by 2050 with an additional six to 10 billion at risk during high tides. 
Um, when an area is zoned, for instance, for commercial or residential use with a lot of existing homes or businesses, it's legally, socially, and politically difficult to try to limit new development and especially redevelopment due to future hazards. Um, for instance, in the city of Eureka, the vast majority of the city's commercial and industrial development is located in the coastal zone, um, and some of it's in vulnerable areas, and it's really hard for the city because that's their tax base um, to want to, you know, not increase density um, in those hazardous areas. Uh, one thing Humboldt has going for it is that there is relatively less development in hazardous coastal areas than in other parts of the state. And the development is also relatively less expensive, making it relatively easier to adapt. So for instance, think about the feasibility of buying out million dollar homes on the beach in Southern California. Um, my third thing I wanted to talk about here is oh yeah, the need for more housing. So California coast is this finite, highly desirable place and we are losing coastal uplands at an unprecedented rate. Um, as we're losing ground to sea level rise, our population is surging and we have this terrible housing affordability crisis. And the desire to create more housing can be at odds with reducing development density in hazardous areas. Some of the most hazardous areas of the Bay, like Fields Landing, are also affordable places to live and that's not a coincidence. Um, so perpetuating affordable housing in vulnerable areas is, seems problematic, but so is losing affordable housing stock. Um, so any retreat needs to be paired with relocation and that takes a lot of advanced planning. Um, one opportunity is that the Coastal Commission and the state at large has a growing focus on housing affordability um, and environmental justice that will at the very least hopefully you know require a, more of a consideration of how adaptation affects affordable housing and whether there are disproportionate impacts for people that are already um, more burdened by um, environmental burdens. And um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was how um, another thing that's going on in Humboldt is we have, and everywhere basically in the United States, is we have urgent needs to update infrastructure in um, vulnerable areas around Humboldt Bay now where the updates would have important and immediate social and environmental benefits. So for instance, adding an interchange at Indianola addresses the very real danger of crossing at that intersection. The proposed sewering of Fairhaven would end the ongoing water quality degradation caused by septic systems out there. And investing millions to update Arcata's wastewater treatment plant will improve the water quality of treated wastewater discharge to Humboldt Bay. But on the flip side, these public investments extend the life of vulnerable infrastructure um, and perpetuate existing development patterns in hazardous areas. And in some cases, like the sewering of Fairhaven, they may even spark new additional private development in hazardous areas. Um, but these projects also present an opportunity because when large infrastructure projects are proposed, that triggers coastal development permitting and allows the commission or local government to require real adaptation planning. Um, in contrast, when infrastructure improvements are piecemealed over time, it's much harder to require comprehensive planning and adaptation through permits of minor work. Um, the commission really struggles with permitting in these situations where there are urgent needs for infrastructure improvements in vulnerable areas. One tactic that we are seeing, are starting to see a lot, is the commission issuing a limited term authorization to upgrade the infrastructure in its existing hazardous location with a condition that planning be undertaken to address hazards in the long term prior to permit expiration. Um, this happened with that 101 safety corridor improvement project. Uh, We're also seeing the commission require a phased adaptation approach where protection, um, hard armoring is allowed in the short term if there is a real plan in place um, for long term retreat in um, areas where things are really hazardous. Like we just saw that at the latest commission hearing with um, the railroad um, in Del Mar, if anybody saw that in the news. Um, but uh, that that's the end of my remarks. I don't know if Mike has something to add. Um, no, I'm just ready for questions. This is this is good, good, good place to get into the discussion. All right. Well, thanks so much. That's super informative and interesting. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat asking, um, Kristen, if you are um, 
if, if your slides will be available, if we can share those with, um, with folks. So it, that's up to you. If you want to share them with me, I can, I can send them out to people. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Okay, um, great. And then here is a question for Kristen. What is one policy change, if enacted now, would have the most impact on protecting coastal resources from sea level rise going into the future? Oh man. <laughs> I have to think about that. That's yeah. a hard question to answer. I don't want to just um, off the cuff that. Right, right. I understand. So go ahead. Yeah, spend a little time thinking about it and I will I will find another question that there's a couple others in here. Um, one was um, a comment that in light of the need to move people and homes out of the low areas due to sea level rise, um, how is it that we're even considering having some housing under the bridge? Oh, yeah. So um, I believe what they're going to be proposing is is like RV parking, you know, like RV camping. Um, and so I would def there's definitely going to have to be a hazards analysis with that um, because that area has probably also got high liquefaction um, potential and um, we do have, you know, the potential for, um, you know, no warning on tsunamis up here uh, because of the Cascadian subduction zone, which um, you don't want a bunch of stuff in, in the tsunami zone that could become battering rams because there's not going to be, in certain, in, you know, if, if it's a Cascadian event, we're not going to be able to um, get out. But in that case, with, with um, it's not any permanent development, it would be just RVs, then um, we definitely look at different types of development differently in terms of their anticipated lifetime and, and how, um, how easy they would be to relocate or remove if, if sea level rise occurred. And I could see, um, you know, like I mentioned at the end, uh, the commission has, that's gonna be a, a city permit, but um, I, you know, the commission in certain cases will issue a limited term authorization to a development that maybe is safe currently uh, from flooding, but isn't gonna be, you know, we don't know if it's gonna be safe from flooding 30 years from now, then they would issue a limited term permit, um, you know, saying it's consistent with the minimized hazard risk for, you know, we can guarantee that, or we're, we're pretty sure that's gonna be the case for 15 years, so here's a, a 15 year authorization kind of thing. Um, Mike, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, with relationship to, I mean, for one, I, you know, I try not to um, comment too deeply on projects that might come before our board as an appeal. <laughs> um, yeah. Because we're supposed to be quasi-judicial in that. But um, I would say that it is not permanent housing and that really the, the, the bigger controversy related to housing and sea level rise is more in the Fairhaven and Fields Landing areas. Um, and it's interesting because we, we, I mean, then talk about that perspective, the North Coast is so different than when we're talking about sea level rise in Southern California, where those properties would all be two and $3 million and four and $5 million a piece, you know, and, and the motivations for, and the discussions are just so different down there. Um, uh, and, and sort of the willingness for people to really in my opinion, stick their head in the sand because they're, you know, you're just talking about billions upon billions of dollars. And so in some ways we're, we can speak a little bit more realistically about these issues here in this area, even though these, these are people's houses and they are important or there's people's lands and various things that they have value, certainly huge for us, but you know, it's orders of magnitude different when you're talking about mm, Seal Beach or other places, or Man, you know, uh, Manhattan Beach and other places like that, um, where, and the politics are a bit different there too, um, I would say. Um, so, uh, it, and in terms of like this, the retreat um, discussion, or even just how to address sea level rise in general, really talking uh, to communities about, um, regional approaches um, and almost almost like creating hazard districts, almost like we create flood districts, because in some ways the commission also has the job of protecting the rest of California, protecting those values for the rest of California, but also protecting the rest of California from bad decisions made by local governments associated with, you know, ignoring sea level rise and then 
coming back hat in hand, you know, asking for the resources when the planning hadn't been done uh, in the timely manner or in a way that could be done now. So those that's a balance that we're so we're dealing with, and we have been encouraging uh, more regional wide um, uh, adaptations. And I think out of the Coast Commission's jurisdiction, a good jurisdiction that has been doing a, a job of that has been the San Mateo area, where they've created a basically a, a sea level rise flood district. And they're starting to, which means that they're actually gathering resources within the areas that are, you know, to be impacted and doing planning based on those resources. So complicated. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm just going to do a little shameless plug here for all of you before people start um, leaving the meeting. We do have um, a special interest group on sea level rise that Aldron Laird um, is the, the group leader and they meet um, on the third Thursday of each month. So coming up this week and so if you're at all interested in participating in that group, you can go to the Ollie website and get signed up. Um, but it's an ongoing discussion and a great way to, to bring these questions forward and to have some discussion. Um, and Aldron, as you, as you mentioned, Kristen, he has um, He's very knowledgeable and, and just really active in um, getting the information out to people. Yeah, and I want to put a plug in for those interested in, in talking with Aldrin about that, because one of the things he's been really active on is the understanding of this public trust doctrine and the public trust responsibilities that we have as agencies. And it's not just the Coastal Commission, it's actually all of the agencies and jurisdictions that have public trust lands. And those are basically, I know that the but the line that was shown on the map by Kristen was somewhat, you know, politically created at some point, but a lot of that public trust delineation was really goes back to the formation of the state of California and that public trust doctrine actually comes, um, you know, from um, all the way back, I think, to the Romans in terms of like understanding the, the, the public's interest in those lands, right? Uh, which and and um, and it's an overlay that we sometimes lose in the discussion about you know what private ownership is in those and that that basically all private properties we consider private properties that those that in those public trust lands have a public trust overlay but basically it's an easement that came with the 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 creation of the state and that we as jurisdictions are supposed to manage that easement in the public's best interest. And so we have those discussions very deeply at the Coastal Commission, but at local jurisdictions, that's not as, um, it's not as well understood because to be quite honest, you know, it, it's just, it's a, only a piece of what maybe a city council or, or may deal with um, in terms of what they're, what, they're, what they're doing or a county jurisdiction, for instance. Um, and so that, you know, that conversation and that happens even in, you know, I would say there's, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, an issue with that with relationship to a structure uh, on basically what are in, you know, on public trust lands uh, having to do with um, a billboard, for instance, and what are the, what are the public trust responsibilities uh, that we're supposed to and deal with. And I think it would be good for the public to be educated well on, on what those responsibilities are to everybody. Um, and I think Alderon Laird is a good place to, to, to get that information because he's well studied in that. Um, the hardest part about talking about public trust resources and anyone that can help with this is, is bringing it down to a pedestrian level where everyone can understand it. And um, I think uh, if, if there's anyone out there that can be creative in that and working with Alderon and how we can do that for all of our public trust lands and helping our local jurisdiction just jurisdictions understand the responsibility that they have to the public, not just to property owners, on that overlay, that would be uh, really helpful. So the challenge is out there. Sure, for sure. Um, and somebody asked me that the um, special interest group meets the third Thursday from 2 to 3.30 and you can sign up on the OLLI website um, and you can send me a message um, at OLLI at humboldt.edu if you have questions about it. Um, Kristen, did you have a chance to think about that, that question I threw your way? Yeah, and somebody else wrote, would it be useful to have the state require LCP updates? And I wish there was some requirement for all the jurisdictions to work together to do a Humboldt Bay 
sea level rise adaptation plan together, um, and, you know, uh, where we all agreed to the policies and nobody could walk away from the negotiation table, you know, um, that'd be an ideal situation. All right, uh, let's see. I see lots of um, thank yous and great presentations. So I just always want to make sure that both you, um, Kristen and you, Mike, um, do know that people do appreciate that you take your time to come and share this information um, with, uh, with our um, members and, and lots of non-members here today. So thank you all for being here. Any other questions? Anything that I'm missing? Yeah, I have a couple, of oh. course. <laughs> <laughs> I always do, sorry. Is there, advocacy for modifying the legislation, the state legislation, to give the commission more control over the changes we see coming with sea level rise, such as requiring local uh, updates and requiring adaptation in case our projections are wrong, and how there, uh, if there will be requirements for moving back. For example, in Connecticut, um, there are properties along the coast that the state came in and said, uh, we won't allow you to rebuild unless you either elevate your property 16 feet, your house 16 feet, or abandon it. So um, they use the leverage of, uh, you know, financing or not financing uh, the reconstruction if it was worse than 60, 50% of the property, um, they had to elevate their property or abandon it. Are we looking at issues like that, such as with Fields Landing? I can answer a little bit of that. Um, there is discussions, I have to say, like there's not really great advocacy um, for change, I mean, the changes that people have been advocating for lately um, have, have not been all that great at the legislature. There's been some of related to sea, sea walls and, and those sorts of things and trying to um, give people more rights to build sea walls and protection of private properties and not take into account or not have to um, um, uh, yeah, have an, any, any understanding or, or accountability to the liabilities of the public trust element of that and and there those impacts and so we mostly been fighting that kind of stuff i would say that um that one of the issues that we've been talking about i don't know if there's legislation related to it has to do with um you know a real estate uh, disclosures and understanding that we need to have make sure that if there's any of this mapping that there's this that the, the very minimally that there's disclosures there we've been having discussions with the uh, realtors associations who in the southern end of the state really against having these kind of disclosures on those properties because they're like oh my god we're gonna but it's reality and they and and they are starting to come around to do to to understand the need for those for those um for those types of things and i think we could probably uh mm -hmm. legislate that better um uh, and um and tying funding for infrastructure, I think, would probably be a good way. And, and I think what you're what you're talking about is, is um, would be helpful for sure. Um, it would be helpful if um, you know that that. Um, well, I guess that's about enough. I mean, there's there's a, there's a list of things. Oh, I guess I want to add to that though. We've also been talking about um, the, the Coastal Commission used to have. Um, and this is separate from sea level rise, but it has to do with legislature. We used to have uh, the ability to require affordable housing um, uh, elements as part of our, you know, what we were doing in terms of like, you know, in terms of permitting housing projects, and that was removed from the from the commission some time ago. Uh, and it would be, I think, very helpful if the commission had that power again and through the legislature to be able to uh, make those requirements. So. How did that get removed and when was it and can it be reinstated in other words? Are there things like that? Are, are there people yeah. advocating for some of these changes that we really will need to address longer term? And if so, who's doing that? 
Uh, there are some organizations that are looking into that. I think uh, Unite Now Local 11, which is a large service workers union in, in LA is one that's advocating for California YIMBY um, is another organization. And I'm just talking about the housing parts of this. Um, I think uh, in terms of the sea level rise elements, I would talk to uh, Jen Savage, who is I think here in this, somewhere in, in this group. Um, and with uh, Surfrider. Um, I think they've been uh, good advocates in terms of the sea level rise part of this. Um, and, uh, and she can, she can put up her, he, she can put up in, and she can put up her contact information in there if she wants in the, in the, in the notes. Um, uh, so the advocacy is ongoing for sure on all, on all those levels. And about Trinidad, and what's going on in Trinidad and the water issue. Um, how does the commission interact with that particular issue and whether it meets the Coastal Commission's requirements? If, I'm just gonna pause for just one second because I have to plug my computer in or it's gonna die. So just hold on and I will answer that question. Just give me like literally 10 seconds. Hold on one second, hold on. <laughs> That happened to me one day. All of a sudden, I didn't realize I hadn't turned on the electric and my battery expired. I got this battery warning. I thought, well, why, why am I have that warning? You know, right. I went blank. <laughs> All right, I'm back. I'm back. Sorry about that. I just need to plug it in. Okay, so with uh, that's an interesting. So what the commission did is the commission approved, which didn't approve. It wasn't a permit, as Kristen mentioned. It was just a consistency determination. So basically, the determination on a split vote was that it was uh, to be, you know, to be consistent with the Coastal Act for the purposes of a loan for for the for the. Um, uh, I think it was the uh, Interior Department. And so, um, the, but the condition of that was that there would be water available to the thing. So that has not there, I don't think there, as far as I know, there hasn't been any communication with the Coastal Commission's staff, as far as I know anyway. And so I'm just, again, um, it's, uh, I, I stay out of it because we're quasi judicial in that regard. It's, we can't really be involved uh, very deeply or at all, but I do, I'm pretty sure there hasn't been. So I would say that the provision of that approval has not been done so that it, but at the same time, the tribe has uh, basically, or the rancheria has said that they, and, the, and I think the interior department says they are not, it's immaterial to them what the decision was gonna be either way in terms of their eligibility for the loan. That's, that's what I've heard. Anyway. And then I read an article about the fact that the, there is a possibility that Trinidad Bay will be turned over as a federal um, gift or however it is to the tribes and how that might impact uh, the Coastal Commission's role with respect to that and what are the legal relationships between the Coastal Commission and tribal lands. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is the transfer to trust status, and I don't have any information on that, and it's not it's not something that has been brought to the commission, at least at the commission level. So I don't really, there's nothing I, I can tell you other than, I, and I don't even really know if there's a consistency determination as part of that. So I've, I've not seen that because I don't know if it's considered a project per se. Does the commission have any, um any legal relationship or legal control over tribal lands? Um, tr tribal lands, tribal trust lands are not in the coastal zone. They're, you know, um, basically they're, the tribe is a sovereign nation and, and that's their lands. But like with, um, when lands are put into trust, there is review by the commission and um, often there'll be discussions about things like with the um, Trinidad Harbor, mm -hmm. making sure that there's continued coastal access and that we don't lose that. And so I know with other tribal trust lands, um, tribes will reach out with to us um, even after their lands have gone into trust um, when they're gonna take some new action um, that might conflict with 
you know, what we agreed to um, before, before they went into trust. But it definitely changes um, the Coastal Commission's, uh, you know, legal relationship with them and, and to the degree to which, um, you know, federal consistency review authority is not um, as strong as uh, permitting, coastal development permitting authority. Um, so when they contact you, it's a nicety versus a requirement. Uh, yeah, I mean, after they're put into trust land, it's not in the coastal zone. But um, we can do federal consistency review, like I said before, if there's an impact on the coastal zone. So um, we've done that. For instance, there was some, I remember when I started back in 2014, there was some um, project up in Del Norte County on um, Elk Valley Road or something like that, where there was a roundabout and part of it was on tribal trust lands, but it was going to impact um, maybe Western Lily or some other sort of coastal resource in the coastal zone. So we did federal consistency review on that. Um, even though it was outside the coastal zone, it would have coastal resource impacts. Great. Uh, I, I do want to point out that that conversation it happened before I was on the Coastal Commission. So, and I think maybe even before <laughs> Kristen was staff, maybe, with relationship mm -hmm. to the request for um, for our advisory on that transfer at the harbor. Great. Any other questions? Well, I just see in the chat that um, Paul um, indicated that the um, land that were the the roundabout that we're talking about was um, on Humboldt Road in Crescent City. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Are we done? Any other comments? Any other closing remarks from Kristen or Mike? Any other pleas for our assistance? <laughs> well, fabulous job. Thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate everything that you share. And we'd like to give a round of applause. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. The thumbs thank up. you so much. And on we go. Next week, we're going to be talking about changes in the air for the Sequoia Park Zoo with Gretchen Ziegler, who is still on board despite having allegedly retired. She's still there. So. <laughs> I want a spe be special shout out to our staff, Kristen uh, Kenyon, Hello. who did a wonderful job uh, with this. I just want to say, like, um, she. Uh, you know, our staff at the Coast Commission is, we are what you would call understaffed, right? Uh, which means they work extra hard uh, uh, to, to get the job done. They're heroes uh, in protecting the coast. And what people, you know, often say is, oh, you know, what do you guys do? There's nothing there. And so, and so oftentimes we say like, that's right, that's right. Uh, what, uh, what we, uh, it's what we don't see on our California coast that we should be appreciating the most. Um, and so it's uh, do the staff uh, and all their hard work. Um, to, and, and so I just wanna put a shout out there and thank you, Kim and Jane for organizing this. And, and I appreciate everybody's uh, interest and activism in, in, these, in these realms. And so, yeah, pay attention. All of the, all these coastal issues are important. Um, they're important for our culture, they're important for our place um, and our environment. And, and, and so thanks for your involvement. And Kristen, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. There is one, uh, one uh, parting remark, Coastal Commission staff rocks.